What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's some of my final thoughts ahead of the Game Week 30 deadline. So I'm going to go through the latest press conference information and what that means for our FPL squads, answer some of your questions, and then take a quick look at my team as well. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already, and let's get into it. All right, let's start with the Liverpool team news. This is what Jurgen Klopp said in terms of injury updates. So Curtis Jones will train today. Not really a massive one for FPL that. Canate missed training for an extra rest day, nothing else. So presumably he's available. Some people might be looking at slightly cheaper Liverpool defenders because obviously the fixtures are good right now and they've got that double in 34. But I think with Canate, despite the fact he's only 4.9 million, I would just ignore him because even if he's available to start against Brighton in game week 30, he'd probably miss game week 31. And obviously in the, t in the double, you've got two games back to back. He'd probably miss one of those as well. He's just not the kind of player that can play every single game. If you're going to go for a defender right now, the only one you'd almost guarantee to play every match from now until 34 is Van Dyke, right? So I think you've just got to pay the extra for that. Uh, Andy Robertson not training today, so on Friday, but not as bad. I think he said they're going to have to assess him kind of day by day. So it's not like he's going to be out for a long time, but he is probably going to miss Brighton at home. Then we'll have to wait and see if he's available for Sheffield United at home. I think with Liverpool, they're playing Sunday, obviously this weekend, and then Thursday against Sheffield United. I'll just double check that. I think it is Thursday. Uh, it is, yeah, Sunday this week. And then, yes, Thursday. I should know that already, but I just wanted to double check. So Robertson's out. I don't think anyone should be looking at him anyway because he doesn't have that left-back spot nailed down. Gomez has played a few games there too. And then on Trent, Jota, and Allison, he said they all from next week onwards will start joining parts of training. So presumably, for Trent in particular, that means he's going to miss game week 30. And if he's only just back into training next week, he's probably going to miss game week 31 as well, which means someone like Bradley should start both games. So if you've held him through till this point, hopefully he'll start against Brighton and Sheffield United. Not a guarantee because Gomez could play right back. But I think with Robertson being a doubt, that is less likely. Like, are we going to see Gomez on the right and Simakas on the left? I'm not sure we will. So I think there's a good chance that Bradley will start the next two. Potentially, he might get game week 32 as well, but it's against Man United away, so you wouldn't be expecting a clean sheet. There was a tweet that came out yesterday, I think it was from Paul Joyce, saying that Trent is targeting probably that Crystal Palace game. So he might miss game week 32 as well, though that's not a guarantee. But either way, you're probably only getting Bradley as a short-term option in 30 and 31. Would I buy him now? Or would I put him on wildcard? I'm not so sure because he does block a Liverpool spot. And in game week 34, you probably are going to want three of them for Fulham away and Everton away. The only thing to say is if you've got Bradley and you're just looking to bring a defender in later on, like Van Dyke or maybe even Trent if he's fully fit, then obviously you could sell Bradley as long as you've got enough money. So for me... I've got Bradley in my team. I'm probably going to buy Darwin and Salah next week. And if I do that and I want to get Van Dyke in, then I'll just sell Bradley later on by getting the funds from another move. So I don't hate the transfer in of Bradley. And I can see why people might want to do it because of his price. Obviously, there's some upside with two back-to-back -back home games and Trent is out. But as a long-term pick, I'm not sure he's the one. And it could just leave you having to use another transfer later on. So I think it's good if you've got Bradley already. I'm not sure I'd be buying him in most scenarios based on how people's teams are set up. Obviously, Allison still out is good for Kelleher owners. We still don't really know how long-term that will be. And obviously, if Jota's back in training next week, eventually that might impact the minutes of Darwin and Diaz, but he's not back yet. Just on Darwin, because I haven't got it listed on screen, he's apparently fine. He's been training as well. So anyone that wants to bring him in this week, I'd be pretty certain he's going to start against Brighton as well. So I think we can probably cover Arsenal pretty quickly. On Saka, Martinelli and Gabriel's chances of facing Man City, this is what Arteta said. There is a chance. They have trained, but tomorrow we have another session. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I wouldn't be completely shocked if they have all trained because Arteta is not necessarily the most forthcoming with injury news. We've even seen like players not being pictured in training when they have actually trained. Like That's how closely guarded some of the you know, Arsenal team news is. And fair play, right? They're not forced to give away injury news, so why would you, right? They might not have trained, but I wouldn't be completely surprised if they have. I guess with Martinelli, it's a little bit less sure because he did miss game week 28 through injury. But with Saka and Gabriel, they pulled out of international duty. Man City away, 
you know, the biggest game they've got left this season, at least on paper, they're going to be in that 11. They are so important to that team. Obviously, someone else could play on the left instead of Martinelli, right? I wouldn't be shocked at that. But I'd be very shocked to see someone play on the right instead of Saka. And I just don't see we're going to see, I don't think we're going to see a lineup of Ben White, Saliba, Kivior, and then Zinchenko or someone like that on the left. I just don't think it's going to happen. So if you've got Gabriel and Saka and you want to play him this week, personally, I don't really have any doubts about their place in that first 11. They're both still in my 11. Obviously, if I had a defender with a better fixture, I would bench Gabriel because I'm expecting him to concede. But we know he's good from set pieces. And Saka, pretty confident about his minutes. He's on penalties as well. And if you haven't got anyone else better on the bench, then you can just play him too. And obviously, the fixtures after game week 30 are pretty good for Arsenal. And they've got that double in 34. So I think even if I was wildcarding and I wanted Gabriel and Saka, I'd probably still include them. I certainly wouldn't sell them this week uh, unless you're looking to maybe wildcard in game week 31. Then in that particular scenario, you could do it. So let's see what happens. Uh, and maybe they haven't trained. Maybe I'm wrong and they're going to train tomorrow. But I'd be shocked if Gabriel and Saka are not in that first 11. So it's good news if you own any Spurs players. Ange Postacoglu said that everyone got through internationals okay. He also went on to say that everyone trained fully today as well. He did speak about Van de Ven separately and said that he's trained the last couple of days and feels good. So he should be available for Luton at home in game week 30. And you'd assume that he would start as well. So for anyone that owns him, that's good news. But also it's good for anyone that has any Spurs defenders, right? Because they've got their first choice back for available. So Doggy, Poro, etc. That's all positive. There was some news that came out yesterday that Richarlison was apparently carrying a bit of a knock. And I saw this tweet from Tom Barkley, who confirmed the Van de Ven stuff, that he would be available for Luton. And then apparently Postacoglu said, Richarlison has had a niggle, but has trained today and is available too. So he's surely going to be in the squad for Luton at home. Is he going to start? That's hard to say because obviously he was injured before the international break. Didn't play a single minute, I don't think, for Brazil either. So they might ease him back into the team a bit slower. So it could be another bench appearance uh, for him against Luton. But I do think overall Spurs are better with him in the number nine and Son on the left rather than Son through the middle and someone else on the left. So I think if he is fully fit and available, which isn't what Ange Postecoglou necessarily said, I think he would start. But there is still that slight chance of a, you know, a bench and then coming on later on. I think for anyone that doesn't own Richarlison, it's pretty easy just to avoid him. For those on wildcard, you're probably not looking at going for kind of a double or triple up on Spurs attack. Maybe two, I guess. But it's probably going to be Son and Madison in that case. Um, for anyone that owns him, would I play him against Luton at home? That's really tricky. I guess it depends who's on your bench. Like if I had Foden on the bench against Arsenal at home, who I knew was almost certainly going to start, or Richarlison against Luton at home but could get benched, I'd probably go for Foden. I just want those extra minutes, even though it's a tougher game. But if you've got someone rubbish on your bench, or you're not convinced about them getting any points anyway, then I guess you could just risk Richarlison if you've held on to him this long. Because if he does start, Luton at home is obviously a fantastic fixture. So for Man City, Pep Guardiola confirmed that both John Stones and Carl Walker are out of the game against Arsenal in game week 30. From what I could see, he didn't confirm how long... They would be out for in general just that they would miss that Arsenal game. But it's worth saying that Aston Villa at home in game week 31 is on Wednesday. So it is a quick turnaround. So they might miss both game weeks 30 and 31. After that, we'll have to wait and see. I don't think there's massive implications on FPL. There's not going to be a huge amount of people out there that own John Stones. But there might be some that still have Carl Walker. So he's now going to become a little bit of a problem, especially without... Um, any info about how long he's going to be out for. So maybe you could look to get rid of him. But it's worth saying that Man City actually have pretty good fixtures after game week 30. So Villa at home, 31. Palace away, 32. Luton at home in 33. And longer term, obviously, they've got good fixtures, plus a double game week probably to come in 37 as well. But ultimately, I just don't think Man City defenders are worth the headache. Unless we knew for sure that Walker and Stones were going to be out for a month or more, I just probably wouldn't look at any of them. I mean, Pep Guardiola did confirm that Akanji is okay. And I would say that his minutes will go right up if Walker and Stones are out for a while. But there's just no guarantee of that. So I think if you've got Man City defenders who aren't Walker or Stones, then of course, maybe you keep hold of them. But buying them, I'm just not sure. It's something that I would want to do because of the upcoming fixtures, especially if I was on wildcard. I'm just not sure it's worth 
kind of putting yourself through that headache i guess this also helps out arsenal attack as well so if you were kind of wavering about whether to play Saka or someone else maybe this makes it slightly better for him overall that that defense will be weaker but obviously carl walk is not on uh, his side anyway there was no real mention about other players apart from edison which i haven't got on screen here but apparently he's doing better so presumably he'll come back into the team and be fine and then kevin de bruyne Pep said, such an important player. It's been a tough season with him, uh, for him with injuries. He trained well yesterday. We'll see what we are going to do. Be very surprised if Kevin De Bruyne doesn't play against Arsenal because he's such an important player. But I think just to reiterate again, as a long-term FPL pick, he's just not the one. I think everyone should be looking to sell him longer term because there are just better options that you know are going to play every single week. You just can't guarantee that with De Bruyne, especially around Champions League matches. I just don't think he's worth the headache given what his price is. All right, let's move on to Chelsea next. Now, with Cole Palmer, I don't think at any point over the international break he was actually flagged with an injury, but he did go away with England and didn't play a single minute, which I think a lot of us were quite surprised at. I think he deserved at least an appearance off the bench. Um, so there was some speculation that maybe he was carrying a knock. Pochettino said this, uh, he's a little disappointed because he couldn't play or perform with the national team. He had a small problem for the first game and thought he could play the second game. He is okay and training well. I think the plan is if he trains in the same way, he'll be available for the game on Saturday. So didn't get his chance to play for England during the international break, but I don't think there's anything to worry about there. If he is fit, he's always going to play for Chelsea given how integral he's been to that team this season. So if you own him, great news, play him against Burnley at home. Some people might even want to captain him. I don't think that's a terrible shout either. And if you're looking to bring him in, I don't think there's any issues there whatsoever. Um, he went on to say, we still need to assess a few players like Chilwell after playing two games. I was very surprised that Chilwell started twice for England. He doesn't usually play games in quick succession like that, not without coming away with some kind of injury. Uh, and to be fair, Pochettino said... I think he got a knock in his knee. Today, he wasn't uh, ready to train. We will see what will happen tomorrow. I think Pochettino's press conference was on Thursday. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what will happen tomorrow if he can be in the squad. Enzo has still not arrived. So there's a few issues there. I think just quickly on other players that people might be looking at for FPL from Chelsea, especially with their good fixtures coming up. Burnley at home in game week 30, Sheffield United away in 32, uh, Everton at home in 33, and even Man United at home in 31 is not awful. Justo and Petrovic. Now, Petrovic is fine. Um, Chelsea have a list of players on their website who are currently injured and undergoing rehabilitation is a word they use a lot. And Sanchez is on there, but I couldn't see Pochettino mention how long he was going to be out for. I do think long term, like up until game week 38, there's potential for Sanchez to play at some point instead of Petrovic. But I think the fact he's currently injured and Petrovic is playing better anyway probably means he's a perfectly okay pick to go for and the other one is gusto because he was flagged in fpl i'm just going to double check to see if he's still flagged at the time of recording uh he's not okay so he's not flagged anymore so presumably he's fine i couldn't see pochettino mentioning him but he's not in this list of players anyway so if you're looking to buy him he should be good to go obviously at some point reese james will probably get fit again and be able to you know get minutes in that team but honestly, with the fixtures being so good, I would just take the risk on Gusto because of his price, especially if you're wildcarding, because there's no guarantee for when Reese James will be back. And even if he is, he doesn't have a great record of staying fit anyway. And Gusto has played really well. So Palmer, fine. Petrovic looks good, I think. Gusto looks good as well. Chilwell, slight injury. I don't think many people are buying him anyway. So with Bournemouth, Iriola said that there was no issues with Dominic Solanke. And he also went on to say it's a good moment for him personally. We know he's been carrying a knee injury, but it hasn't stopped him playing matches in the Premier League. He always gets 80 to 90 minutes, and he wasn't away with England during the international break. So he's had a two-week break, not having to play games. That can only be a good thing for him and Bournemouth moving forward. And with Everton at home, Palace at home, Luton away, and Man United at home next four, followed by a double in 34, for most people that own him, it's just an easy decision to keep hold of him. Obviously, a lot of what you do with players at the moment will depend on your chip strategy. But if you don't own him, especially if you're dead ending, uh, dead ending into 34 and then wildcarding after, I still think he's a really good option to buy. You know he's always going to play when he's fit. The fixtures are good. There's no yellow card worries there. He's only had two all season. And then you've got that double in 34 as well. So I still really like Solanke as a pick. He's obviously not being talked about as much at the moment because people are on wild cards. And I think if you're free hitting in 34... There's not as much need to go for him. But he's still a really good option over the next few weeks. 
Um, Senesi is out. He's not training with the group yet. I think if you've got him and you're looking to bring in a new defender and you're wondering who to sell, even with the double in 34, I'd probably just get rid. You don't know when he's going to be back. And the double for Bournemouth, yes, is not bad for an attacker. I wouldn't worry about having to play Neto in goal either. But for a defender, it's not great. I own Zabani. I'm not even sure I'm going to play him in game week 34. So I think you can just count yourself unlucky if you went for Senesi. And he can probably be sold if it works for your transfer plans. And just a quick other couple of things. Aaron's is back. So obviously, obviously he affects the right back position. So Smith might not be nailed for too much longer. And Kelly has started training with the group. Iriola didn't say he would definitely be in the squad. But at some point, he is going to be back in the squad and probably going to get minutes. And that could be at left back. In which case, Kirkes is even more of a worry than he already has become. So a bit like Senesi, if you've got Kirkes and it works for your transfers to get rid of him, I don't think there's any need to hold on to him for game week 34. And then Sinister is out for some weeks. Uh, he probably will play before the end of the season, but that um, helps Tavernier. So anyone that hold, held on to him and might want to keep him for the double in 34, he should continue to get good minutes. He was anyway, to be fair, but I just wanted to mention that at the end. So Newcastle players are going to gain a bit of traction from this week onwards because the fixtures they have from now until game week 38 are pretty decent all round. And obviously longer term, they will have that double game week and game week 37 as well. So this is what Eddie Howe said in terms of their injuries. Um, Botman decided not to have knee surgery in September when medical staff advised he should. Went on to say the operation last week went well. We know that Botman is out for a long time. It's going to be six to nine months. Hopefully he recovers well and gets back to playing again after that. He's not an option for FPL, of course. I think next to Trippier, the second most attacking Newcastle defender is Fabian Cher. If you've got the money, you could go for him. But for a lot of people, this just means buying Lascelles now because if you want a Newcastle defender, of course, and you can't afford Trippier, because he's only 3.9 million. And it's an absolute bargain. And if you look at the amount of home games that Newcastle have, like West Ham and Everton at home next two games, there's a home game against Sheffield United in game week 35. The double in 37 is Brighton at home, Man United away. Okay, not so great, but you've got an extra uh, double game week along the way. And there's some other okay games in there as well. 34 is Palace away, 36 is Burnley away. So it was a cheap, a cheap pickup on wildcard. I think Lascelles looks good. Some people are still saying, what if Dan Byrne plays centre-back and Liveramento plays left-back? Look, that is a possibility, but we have not seen it very often this season. And when Botman was out injured already this season, obviously before this current injury, Lascelles played pretty much every single minute. I actually had a look on transfer market for Dan Byrne this season where he's played. The three games he started in the Champions League, all at left back, I could only find one game in the Premier League where he played centre back from the start, and that was game week four. Every other game he's played has been left back. Same for the FA Cup. And there was one game apparently, the quarter final against Chelsea. 45 minutes at centre-back. So what's that? Two games at centre-back for the entire season? Bearing in mind, Botman was out for quite a while. So I just think if you want Lascelles, if he fits into your team, your wild card, whatever it is, if you need an enabler to fund another move, I'm pretty sure Lascelles is going to play. Is it possible that Dan Byrne plays centre-back? Yes, but it's not very likely, I would say. Um, Lewis Miley is out. Still unclear what the injury is. Probably doesn't affect FPL too much. The other players was, uh, that were mentioned... Well, Harvey Barnes, Kieran Trippier, and obviously Liveramento as well. And Eddie Howe said it's possible that they return for tomorrow, so the game in game week 30, and said that Dubravka is fine. So for anyone that held on to Dubravka, great. If you want to play him against West Ham, that's good. I would probably think that Trippier will play, but it's probably not enough confidence to buy him. So I think if you're looking at him, you could maybe put that decision off for another week because he is currently orange flagged. And that's going to continue because Eddie Howe didn't say he was back. It's worth reminding ourselves that Eddie Howe is not always forthcoming with injury news unless unless it's like long-term stuff like Botman. I think Trippier will probably be fine. And I think long-term as an option from 35 onwards in particular, a lot of people will pick him up on wildcard. I just think right now, because people are still trying to fit in Haaland and Salah and Son, etc., Trippy is probably a bit too much money anyway. If you've got the cash or you want to build your squad a little bit different, he could be worth the risk, but he is not a guarantee to play in game week 30. All right, let's get into some of your questions. So is Haaland really essential in his current form? He has already missed numerous scoring opportunities, including a penalty during the international break. So the short, boring answer is 
No, he's not essential. Nobody is, right? Yes, there's some very good players that I would definitely have in my team right now, especially if I was wildcarding. But no one's essential. At certain times this season, people have done really well without Haaland. They've done really well without Salah, etc. So you could go without him if you wanted to. The two things that I would think about, one is captaincy. From now until however long term you're planning, game weeks 33, 34, whatever, how many times will you captain him? Because he is quite expensive. For me, the only time I think I really want to go for it is looting a home in game week 33. Yes, there's other weeks where maybe I'll look at it, but he's not absolutely the best captain in a lot of other weeks game week 31 i'll probably go with salah game week 34 double game week probably go with salah as well this week i'm going to go with son so actually there's not a huge amount of times i would look to captain him the other question or the, or the other thing to think about which is probably even more important if you sell harland what does that get you by having him in your team are you missing out on a load of other players if you're not then i'd probably keep hold of him because for me, thinking about form of a player like Haaland is just not worth it, right? Anytime someone mentions form, I always ask questions like, well, when does it start and when does it end? How do you know those things? And the answer is we don't. And all it takes is for Haaland to score a couple of goals and then we're saying he's in form, right? And I think if you look at what he's done so far this season, I'm just going to double check here. It is 22 starts and he scored 18 goals and seven assists. So 25 returns from 22 starts. Maybe he got uh, points off the uh, returns off the bench. I don't know. But that's how many times he started this season. 25 and 22 is pretty good. And if we look at his recent games, okay, he blanked against Liverpool away. Fair enough. Difficult enough game. Scored against United. Assist against Bournemouth. Scored against Brentford. Nothing against Chelsea. Two goals against Everton. So even if we look at recent form, look, is that what you expect from a £14 million player? No, maybe expectations are a bit higher. But he's still got four goals, one assist in in six matches, right? It's not exactly terrible form. He's not he's not like he's not scoring at all. And obviously before that, he was injured for quite a while. So I personally don't think there's this mad rush to get rid of him. I know I've spoken about this a lot this week. I know some people think he's going to get rotated around Champions League. We haven't seen that yet. So I personally don't think that will happen. Would his minutes get reduced? Probably. Will that play a part in whether you want to captain him? Only you can decide that. But I just think, ask yourself, by selling Haaland, what does it get me? And I would love to get Salah this week. And if I got rid of Haaland for a minus four, I could do it. But I know next week, right? Again, I've spoken about this a lot for my own team, right? But if I put Salah in for Bruno Fernandes and I sell Foden to Sarabia, and look, I'm definitely not of the opinion that Foden is a better FPL pick than Haaland all of a sudden, uh, and we get rid of Watkins for Darwin... Well, all of a sudden, right, I've got Haaland, Solanke, Darwin, Son, Salah, Palmer, Sarabia, Saka. I only have to play seven of those eight, eight players. What am I missing, really? You know, a Liverpool defender? Yes, fair enough. Um, but I can, I can figure that out later on. Like, a, a Liverpool defender for game week 34 is not something I need to go out of my way to get. And obviously, later on as well, it's worth remembering, Son's going to blank in game week 34. So depending on what your chip strategy is, it might even make sense to sell him. And as soon as you do that, every other midfielder, apart from Salah, who you already own, and De Bruyne, who no one's probably picking right now, is cheaper. So you're going to free even more funds. Boom, there's my money to get uh, like Van Dyke or Trent or whoever. And obviously, I've already got the double Liverpool defenders for game week 34. Your team might be set up different. Maybe you really want to get Trippier into your team right now and Van Dyke, etc. And you need to free up money. And maybe Haaland's the easier way to do that. Because... Over the next couple of weeks, I would prefer to have Salah instead of Haaland. But I just think for most people, there's not a, there's not a massive gain you get from selling Haaland, in which case I would keep him. Because which other forwards do we think are massively better? Like, this is a guy that's got 25 returns in 22 games. Like, he is consistent. And I think he's got the fixtures to continue that. Arsenal at home's not uh, great. But after that, he should be fine. Anyway, probably don't need to spend nearly five minutes talking about why Haaland is good. But no, he's not essential. But I think most people should probably just keep him. Yes. So if you can't get Nunez as a second Liverpool attacker, is Luis Diaz a good alternative? And I think the simple answer is yes. With the fixtures that Liverpool have from now until they're doubling 34, any of their attackers like Diaz, Nunez and Salah are worth looking at. So if you've got a space in midfield, happy days. You can definitely look at him. Obviously, at some point, Jota's going to be back. And when he's fully fit and available... He will probably take minutes off of Darwin and Diaz, but we don't yet know when that is. And even if he is fully fit again, 
he might get managed slowly back into that team, make a few sub appearances and things like that. So I really like Diaz. The reason that you're hearing more about Darwin is just because he's a forward. And a lot of people are struggling to fit in more midfielders. So players like Salah are obviously right now super popular. Palmer super cheap. Some people want to keep hold of Son. You might be looking at some cheap enablers for the double game week like Sarabia, maybe Eze. Uh, some people still have Foden. Like in my midfield, I've got Saka, Foden, Son and Palmer. And the fifth one is Fernandez. And that spot is basically for Salah. So there's no players there that I want to sell right now to get Diaz. And even if I did want to sell someone like Foden, it would have to be a cheaper midfielder so that I can afford to get Salah in the team. So it really depends on how your team is structured and set up and also what your chip strategy is as to whether it's better to go for Darwin or Luis Diaz, essentially. I will say, if they play the same minutes from now until 34, my money would be on Darwin scoring more points, but that's not a guarantee. We saw in game week 24 when people started to bring Liverpool attackers in ahead of the double in 25. Diaz did really well. Obviously, the, the double in 25 itself was not a fair fight because Jota and Nunez got injured, etc. But Diaz is a really good player to go for. Similarly, I know this question's about Liverpool, but ahead of the double in 34, some people might be looking at tripling up on Arsenal who, are, who aren't already tripled up. And in that case, I like the option of going for like an Odegaard or a Havertz alongside Saka for double attack instead of double defence, if that fits your team better. For my team, I've already got Saliba, Gabriel and Saka. There's no need to spend transfers changing that around unless there's injuries. But for someone who's not there already, then Odegaard, like I said, or Havertz as a, as a punt alongside Saka could be an option, just like going for Diaz instead of Nunez. So I do prefer Nunez, but that is partly biased because that fits into my better t uh, team better. If you want to go for Diaz instead, good option. So should we start with Madison on wildcard and move to Richarlison later for funds or start with Richarlison and save a transfer? I think in this case, if you are dead set on bringing in Richarlison at some point anyway, because you believe his first choice, his minutes are still going to be good when he's fully fit, I'd probably just go with him now. Because although it's not a guarantee that he starts in game week 30, I still think there's a good chance it could happen. And if he is going to be in the squad this week, presumably he's going to be fine for game week 31 onwards, as long as he doesn't pick up a new injury. So I think in this case, I would just start with him. The only way I wouldn't is if you're unsure about whether he is still first choice, because Spurs do have a lot of options, right? Song can play through the middle. Johnson, Kulisevsky, Werner, etc. can play in the wide positions. They don't necessarily need Richardson, but I do think if Ange Postacoglu was picking his best 11 this week and everyone was fully fit, Richardson would be in it as the nine with Son on the left. So I still think from an FPL point of view, Richardson is a good option. There are maybe just question marks over game week 30 itself. But in terms of you know, goal threat and stuff like that when they're on the pitch. I think Richarlison is better than Madison. None of them have penalties uh, either way. And Richarlison is that cheaper price. So I think I would start with him if you're dead set on moving him on later. If you can set up in a way where you've got Madison and it's not going to affect your future transfers, you just might need the money, then maybe I'd play it a bit safer and go for Madison. But for everyone else, probably just start with Richarlison. So is Foden the sacrificial lamb for our wildcard teams? Or can we downgrade one of our forward spots to a 4.5 million-ish forward instead? So someone like Meniz, Mateta, Cunha, etc. And I think this applies to non-wildcard teams as well. A lot of people that own Foden might have to think about selling him soon. I know I'm considering that uh, next week in particular. Let me just say this. I don't think he's essential. If you've built a wildcard team for game week 30, it's got every player you want and the only player you're missing is Foden. I would say go ahead with that. Yes, he's a really good option. He's a nice price. His minutes have been better recently than we've seen in previous seasons. He's playing really well. He's a decent FPL pick still, especially after game week 30 because the fixtures get better. But he's not essential. So if you've built your dream squad, you're only missing Foden. I say go with it and hope for the best. The reason that I think a lot of people are having to consider selling him is because you can't have everyone, right? We say that a lot in FPL over the course of a season. But if you want to keep Haaland and you want to have Salah, someone has to be sacrificed. And I think for a lot of people, it is Foden. I do think there's also a possibility that he could get a rest soon because he has played a lot of minutes. I don't think it comes against Arsenal, but Villa at home, Palace away, Luton at home, Brighton away, Forest away. Next um, kind of five fixtures after Arsenal. He could miss one of those games, especially with Champions League matches and stuff like that. I don't think Haaland will miss out because we just haven't seen it yet but we have seen Foden be rested before. I will say as a counterpoint, 
De Bruyne not being able to sustain a run of matches because of injuries and being managed and stuff like that probably means it's less chance than normal that Foden gets rotated and rested. I think it's a possibility still, but less so than previous seasons. So by no means am I saying that Foden has to be sold, and I may even keep hold of him next week, but I don't think he's essential when you're trying to fit in all those other players. Like for, for me, for example, without getting into it too much for my own team, the decision next week will be Son or Foden. Like whichever one of those two players I have to sell, I won't be happy about it. But if I want Darwin, I want Salah, someone has to go, and that is the case. So you just have to look at your team and rank those players who you really want best till last. And if Foden doesn't make the cut of the top five midfielders or you can't fit him in, then he has to go. And for what it's worth, just on this um, you know, 4.5 million forward, if I was wildcarding this week, I would want Harlan and Darwin. So there's only one more forward spot. And if you're not free hitting in 34, I'd probably want Solanke as well for the good fixtures before 34 and the double game week in 34 itself. Therefore, there's no room for a 4.5 million forward, in which case I would sacrifice Foden. I'd rather have Harlan, Darwin, and Solanke from now until 34 than Foden. That might backfire. Man City have the fixtures where Foden could absolutely do well. But if you get lucky, and it's the Luton at home game he misses, for example, right in between the Real Madrid Champions League matches, then happy days, it can pay off. There's always going to be a slight risk with players you don't go with. You can only pick 15. I think it's okay to drop Foden if you need to. So I'm just going to quickly talk about my own team. And to be honest with you, there's not really anything that's changed from yesterday's video. So if you've watched the team selection video in full already this week, you can probably just switch off from this one. The only minor thing is maybe being a little bit happier about captaincy. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So at the back, I've got Neto in goal, Everton at home, and Zabani in defence. Also with Everton home, of course. So a double up on Bournemouth defence, which is not ideal, but it's just damage limitation for me in game week 30. My defence is the weakest part of this team, I would say. I've got Gabriel still in the 11, who, who is yellow flagged, as we've discussed, but I'm pretty confident he's going to start. I do have Saliba on the bench, so I could just play him instead. And I think at this point, he's probably slightly lower owned as well. So I might make that switch, but I'm just certain that Gabriel is going to start. And I do think he's a bigger threat from set pieces so he's probably who I will go with the other option is Doughty who is fine but I just don't see a clean sheet against Spurs away whatsoever and although he's attacking I think I'd rather go for the goal threat from Gabriel also because Man City and Arsenal are both going for the title I think we expect goals because their attacks are so good but so are their defenses and this could be a cagey match so there is an outside chance of a clean sheet from Arsenal not that I would be putting much money on it and then my other defender is Bradley. And as I've discussed already, Trent's out this week. Probably not going to be back for Sheffield United. So I'm definitely playing Bradley. I think he's like, I don't know, 80% certain to start both of those matches, I reckon. Because Gomez could play left back instead. I just think Bradley will play while Trent is out. He's only missed one game, I believe, which is the FA Cup game against Man United. And although some people will bring him in this week, he's still a massive differential. So I like that aspect as well. In midfield... Palmer, Burnley at home, he's definitely going to play based on what Pochettino said. I'd be very surprised if he misses out. I don't think he's a better captain than Son, so he's my vice captain this week, but still a good option if you wanted to go for it. Fernandez against Brentford away, Saka against City away, again like Gabriel, he's definitely going to start. And then just on captaincy with Son, I think in my team, he's clearly the best option. If I had Salah, I would captain him instead, definitely. But I do think what Postacoglu said about Richarlison having a niggle and then training fully means there are slight doubts about slightly more doubts about him starting I don't think it was guaranteed that he would start anyway but now it's maybe a little bit less so at least that's what I'm telling myself for what it's worth just to the Richarlison owners out there I'd actually probably put it more likely that he starts than doesn't but there is some doubts there and if he doesn't play Son will play number nine and that just makes him a better option overall. So I'm hoping that Richarlison's on the bench and Son gets maybe 60, 70 minutes through the middle. And that could be more than enough to match Salah and maybe even outscore him. That's what I'm hoping. Doesn't necessarily mean I think that's what will happen. And so, yeah, would I rather have Salah captain and Son rather than Son captain and Fernandez? Absolutely right. Fernandez has been pretty good, like three returns last three games. I think he got two assists and the goal in game week 28 in the league anyway. Um, but I'm not stupid, right? I know Salah's a better option, but I just don't think for my team it makes sense to bring him in this week 
because it would take a minus four involving getting rid of Watkins. And it would mean that I don't have Darwin Nunez for Sheffield United at home. And I just want him for that game because I'm not going to sell Harden in game week 31. And I'm not going to sell Solanke either. I've got to keep him all the way till 34. So although by the time we get to game week 34, I might drop Harland just for that one week only before wildcarding him back in, I don't want to do it before then. So Watkins is my only forward spot I'm willing to sacrifice. And Wolves at home is just a good fixture. And if I bring in Mateta or Cunha, like that means I just don't have Darwin for a few more weeks. I think he is clearly first choice for Liverpool. And if he's fit, he's got a good chance of starting all games as well. There is a chance that he plays against Brighton, then he's benched against Sheffield United, and they play Gapo instead. But it's not a guarantee. And unless we've got any indication that's going to happen, I definitely want to buy Darwin next week. So I'm kind of hoping that the decision not to get Salad this week, overall for my team, is better from next week onwards. So I could do it for Fernandez, but it would involve selling Watkins to Cunha or Mateta, someone like, or even Maniz, but I'd probably go for someone with a double in 34. And then as I mentioned, I've got Harden and Solanke. So I'm pretty set. I mean, I know what the deadline stream is going to be like and the comments afterwards. I can't believe you don't have Salah. It's stupid to go without him. I get it. And if I could do it for Fernandez and Foden to Sarabia and Salah, as I discussed yesterday, I would do that. But I'm 0.1 million off and I just don't think it's worth a minus eight. So what I really need to happen is for, I guess, Son to beat Salah, really. I mean, obviously, you always want your captain to beat everyone else's, but if Son could beat him by a good bit, like maybe four, five, six points, then that helps the probable gap there will be between Fernandez and Salah points. But who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky and Fernandez will outscore Salah. That's the dream, even though I don't think it will happen. So pretty well set up. The defense is a little bit weak, but hopefully Bradley on his own will will do enough to mean that I keep up with everyone else. And then from game week 31 onwards, I think I look pretty good. So if you enjoyed that video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button, rate five stars if you're listening on podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with a deadline stream, which might start at 9 a.m. If not, it start at half nine, obviously take you right up until the deadline at 11 a.m. I'm just double checking. It is an earlier deadline this week. Yes, it is. Hopefully I'll see some of you tomorrow for the deadline stream. Good luck either way. And I'll catch you for next week's content.